Hi, everyone. Welcome to Ask Me Academy. My name is Amy Lee Reese. I'll be your host this evening. On behalf of the United Ostomy Associations of America, we are so happy that you are with us tonight. Uh, for those of you who are joining us on live, through Facebook or YouTube, we'd love to know where you're coming from tonight. You can put that in the chat. Um, and also for those people who are uh, watching this recording, um, we would love to welcome you as well. We're so glad that you're here. The United Ostomy Associations of America, or UOAA, is a nonprofit organization that supports, empowers, and advocates for people who have had or will have ostomy or continent diversion surgeries. Our mission is to promote quality of life for people living with ostomies or continent diversions through information, support, advocacy, and collaboration. I'm in my second year on the board of directors for UOAA, and I work with affiliated support groups. Uh, there's over 260 across the country. And if you are interested in getting local support in your area, you are welcome to come to our ostomy.org website and go to the um, support group finder, and you can access that information there um, to find out if there's support group area in, a support group in your area. Another way that UOAA supports the ostomy community is through this program, um, the Ostomy Academy. This free online educational seminar series brings trusted and comprehensive education to people living with ostomies and our community. So stay tuned for announcements about other Ostomy Academy programs that are coming up. We're going to have our next one in May. Um, so that will be... Um, you can go to recordings of past programs or, um, or see this recording uh, on our website. Uh, it'll also be recorded on YouTube as well. We'll put a link for that in the chat. And then if you're interested in getting updates um, on events that are happening with the UOAA, you are welcome to come to our website and uh, register for our e-newsletter. That would be great. So tonight's program is about peristomal hernias. And it is for the many people that are living with um, an ostomy that are either worried about developing a peristomal hernia or already have a peristomal hernia. We will be learning from colorectal surgeon, uh, Jenny Speranza, who will teach us about prevention and the types of surgical repairs. And also WOC nurse practitioner, Ashley Croft, who will talk to us about non-surgical management and other lifestyle and diet suggestions. We would love for you to put your questions in the comments section. Um, we will get to as many of those as we can. Our moderators will be going through those and um, pinning those for the end of the presentation. But we do just want you to keep your questions general and brief. Uh, we don't have, uh, we can't get into specifics about your own case. Um, so we would be recommending you to your own medical care team at that point um, to get those questions answered for you. So without further ado, I would love to bring out our speakers for the evening. Hello, welcome. Hi. Hello. <clears throat> Hi. So um, Dr. Jenny Speranza is an associate professor of surgery at the University of Rochester in Rochester, New York. She is a board certified in general surgery and colon and rectal surgery. She completed her general surgery training at the University of Buffalo School of Medicine. She did her colon and rectal fellowship at the University of Miami and spent a year as a clinical associate at Cleveland Clinic, Florida. She has been in practice for over 17 years and is also a member of a medical advisory board of the United Ostomy Associations of America. Welcome. Thanks so much for having me. And we have Ashley Croft, who's been a nurse since 2008. She went on to pursue specialty training for wound ostomy continence nursing at Emory University in 2014. Shortly after completion, she started her career as a WOC nurse at the University of Rochester Medical Center. During her work as a WOC nurse, she continued her education to expand her scope of practice as an AANP board certified family nurse practitioner. She joined the University of Rochester Medicine Ostomy Services team in 2020. Again, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having awesome. us. All right, so I am gonna um, give you the floor and we will go ahead and start the presentation. 
Excellent. All right, so tonight we're going to talk about peristomal hernias and everything you need to know about them. So as Amy had said, my name is Jenny Speranza and I've been practicing colorectal surgery for quite some time now. I am originally from Rochester, New York and tonight I'm joined by my colleague, Ashley Croft. And as also stated, she's a wound ostomy continence nurse practitioner and she's part of our team and we have a very wonderful team here at the University of Rochester. And we're very excited to be able to deliver this very important educational topic to you on behalf of the UOAA. And as you know, the UOAA is all about advocating for ostomates and I'm very happy to be part of this important activity. Patient education in my practice is extremely important. And as ostomy surgery is very complex, I'll do my best tonight to make sure that you sort of understand about peristomal hernias, uh, what ostomies are, and how they are a life-saving option for patients. You can go back two slides. And we're going to talk about some challenges that ostomates will, may uh, encounter. So next slide. So this is uh, at the University of Rochester. This is our team. We have, and I don't think, unfortunately, Ashley's in one of these pictures. Um, okay. She came after. <laughs> but we are very fortunate to have world-class ostomy services with an entire outpatient clinic devoted solely to ostomy care. We also have stoma support within both of our hospital systems uh, that help patients after surgery and uh, they educate patients, get them acclimated to their new ostomy, and it's a very wonderful setup. Although we have great ostomy care, we understand that many parts of the country don't. Uh, for this reason, I feel really strongly tonight that educational opportunities like this are crucial to individuals to raise the standard of care for all patients who may or may not have an ostomy as well as services available to them. Next slide. So what we're going to talk about today, I wanna to backtrack a little bit because I do think it's nice to have a refresher and for patients who may be contemplating an ostomy, I want you to learn what an ostomy is, what's a parasomal hernia and how come they develop. Also, we're gonna talk about signs and symptoms we're going to talk about how prolapse and hernias are different entities. Uh, for the non-surgical management, uh, Ashley is going to go through this and review some topics as well. And I'm going to give you a brief overview of some of the surgical options for peristomal hernias. Next slide, please. So what actually is an ostomy? So it's estimated that over uh, 1 million people in the United States have an ostomy. And about 100,000 ostomy surgeries happen across the U.S. every year. Ostomates or persons that have an ostomy can live normal, healthy lives. And they can do pretty much anything that a person who doesn't have an ostomy ha uh, can do. And you can see this by these people living their best life. Next slide. So an ostomy is when a portion of the intestine is brought through the abdominal wall to deliver urine or stool out of the body. Again, this is a life-saving surgery and this may be required in cases of birth defects, cancer, diverticulitis, inflammatory bowel diseases such as ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, other intestinal disorders, and patients even have been, uh, who have undergone trauma may end up with an ostomy. Ostomies can be permanent or they can be temporary. And the purpose of the ostomy is to reroute the fecal matter or the urine through the abdominal wall then through its regular route. Next slide. So 
there are different types of ostomies and they're named by what piece of bowel is brought through the abdominal wall. So a colostomy is the portion of bowel arising from the colon, and you can see that here, uh, the colon or um, the large intestine as it's sometimes referred to. And it's brought out through the abdominal wall by a surgical defect that I, that I make or another surgeon will make. And then we mature this uh, piece of bowel so that it empties nicely into a nice pouch. Next slide. An ileostomy is similar. So you can see here, we've excluded the colon and you see the small bowel or the small intestine. And usually we use the end of the small bowel and we make an ostomy out of that. Next slide. And last but not least, there's something known as a urostomy. And that's for patients who have needed to have their bladder removed, have had trauma, have had cancer. And so uh, the surgeon will fashion a piece of bowel and implant the ureters into this piece of bowel. And then the urine will actually exit through the abdominal wall as well. And this again is a life-saving surgery for many individuals. Next slide. So not only do we have different types of ostomies from different sources, but depending on how they're fashioned, will determine what kind of an ostomy uh, shape you'll have and size usually. So an end ostomy is where uh, the ostomy is just one end of bowel and we turn the edges over and then it exits into the pouch. A loop ostomy is where we take a knuckle of bowel and we bring it up through the abdominal wall and then we mature it. And there's one active side and there's a non-active side. This is the easiest to be uh, reversed. And then there's something called a double barrel where we bring up one end and we can mature it and then the other option is the other piece is going to be a mucus fistula where nothing really comes out of that except some mucus from time to time. Next slide. So a peristoma hernia. So ostomates can have issues with their ostomy during their lifetime like any other type of surgery. Usually these are minimal but they can become more serious. One such complication is what we call a peristomal hernia. And you can see here that you have your ostomy, but the aperture that we bring the bowel through has widened. And that can happen for numerous reasons. Uh, a lot of times these holes will enlarge with time. Unfortunately, uh, this is very common in ileostomies at rates of at least 30% and approximately 50% of colostomies will have some sort of hernia. And by definition, bringing the bowel through a surgically created opening is technically a hernia. So it's just with time, this opening can enlarge and then other pieces of bowel or tissue can sneak up alongside it and create this hernia. Most hernias will uh, form within two years of developing an ostomy, but then with time, uh, you can also still develop one later in life, but it's not as common. Next slide, please. So here's a colostomy, and you can see here that with the first image, the colon has snuck up along the side of this stoma, and the opening uh, of the area will become larger and protrude and fatty tissue can protrude through it. But also in the picture on the right, you can see small bowel has snuck up along that hernia defect. And uh, unfortunately, sometimes this can cause a blockage, which is a very serious side effect of peristomal hernias. So unfortunately, these hernias can form for many different reasons. Significant changes in weight gain or a significant weight loss 
can change that size of that small opening in your abdominal wall. Heavy lifting, lifting heavy things can make that area enlarge as well. Pregnancy, all of these things can change that size of that abdominal opening, which they can then lead to other tissue sneaking up alongside that ostomy and stoma. Next slide, slide please. So here's a picture of a very small peristomal hernia. So when someone has a peristomal hernia, some of the symptoms that you can expect to see, um, usually they're going to be minor, but occasionally, like I said before, it can be a very serious or life-threatening problem. Some of the more minor symptoms can be bloating, uh, swelling around the ostomy site. So it looks like there's a small little orange under there. Sometimes it can get even larger. So some more serious concerns though, are going to be if there's leakage and pouching problems. Also, if there's severe pain, partial or total blockages can occur. And those are can be a life-threatening emergency and we suggest that you seek immediate medical attention if you experience that. Whatever symptoms that you're having that are you don't feel are within the norm, you should definitely reach out to your ostomy nurse or your surgeon and they can help you further. Next slide, please. So what about surgical repair? The basic principle of the surgery is to restore that normal diameter closer to the original size, uh, which approximates the dimension of the bowel. Now that's a tricky concept. And you can see here that uh, there's a mesh there, that white disc that's up against the undersurface of the abdominal wall. You can see that this defect had been larger. So sometimes we'll place this mesh through and it will narrow that opening so that other tissue cannot slide up alongside the bowel. These repairs can be performed laparoscopically, they can be performed robotically, and they can even be done locally. Uh, there's lots of different techniques available and your surgeon will use the preference, uh, use the surgical method that they prefer uh, depending on multiple factors, uh, including uh, factors that depend on you and your body and your ostomy. Other options for surgery, and usually this is considered a last resort, is re, uh, removing the ostomy and putting it on a different site on the abdominal wall. We very much don't like to do that because there's a risk of hernia on that side now. So we really try to re, uh, resist reciting and we only use that as a last option. Next slide. So here's a picture of the abdominal wall, uh, looking at it from the undersurface. And you can see the first small image and uh, you can see that whitish uh, mesh that's up against the bowel wall. And it's narrowing that opening so no other tissue can slide around alongside it. And then there's another type of technique and this is another common technique that surgeons will use as a sugar baker technique. And this one is also uses mesh and it helps prevent other tissue from sliding up alongside uh, in that hernia space. Next slide. So this image depicts different places that the mesh can be uh, used to repair the defect. There are different positions that will be determined by your surgeon. And once again, this is, everyone is different. Everyone's body is different. So we very much uh, don't like to say one type fits all. So depending on your body and your hernia, that will determine how your surgeon repairs this hernia. Next slide. So what's the big problem with mesh? So, and what's the problem with surgical repair of these uh, 
peristomal hernias. So this is one of the scientific uh, articles that I included in here. And they looked at 235 patients who underwent repair of their hernias. Unfortunately, their recurrence rates were very high, 13% uh, and 36% within 39 months. So unfortunately, at least a third or more of these patients are going to recur. And this was one of the more uh, conservative measures. Also, unfortunately, patients will occasionally need to be reoperated on. And sometimes there's an, in complications such as infections and mesh complications. So we have to be very judicious when we decide who we're actually going to repair. If it's sometimes just a small hernia or it doesn't really cause pain and the ostomy is working really well, we really try not to operate on the patient because we know that a good one third of those patients are gonna recur relatively quickly. So although it's always an option, we really resist trying to surgically fix these unless absolutely necessary. Next slide. So prolapse stoma or hernia, what's the difference? So you see two ostomies there. And you see one, there's a bulge underneath the skin. This is typical of a peristomal hernia where the opening is widened and other pieces of tissue, bowel or fat or inside the abdomen will sneak up alongside the piece of bowel. When the abdominal pressure is very great or if you're lifting or straining or pregnant, uh, sometimes the bowel can actually just pooch through itself and it can result in an ostomy that grows tremendously, okay? So this is not, so that's a stoma prolapse. Next slide, please. So again, look at this image. Stoma prolapse can be quite alarming, uh, although often, most of the time, it's not a serious thing. It just looks very scary to individuals. And this can occur from long-term, this can be a long-term complication of having an ostomy, and it occurs up to, in up to a quarter of people throughout their lifetime. This can be a sudden permanent or intermittent lengthening of the stoma. Sometimes it'll sneak right back in there when you're, when you're uh, relaxing. And uh, there's certain things that we can do to help with that. And Ashley will discuss that with you. So although it is scary looking, it doesn't necessarily need to be repaired unless it becomes incarcerated, which means it becomes stuck. If it creates a obstruction or a blockage of the bowel content or the urine, if things can't get out, that can be a surgical emergency. If the blood supply gets uh, diminished and it turns dark or purple and there's no, enough blood feeding this, that's a surgical emergency and that needs to be addressed right away. Also, because it, if it gets to be longer than six or seven centimeters, it can cause significant pouching issues. So you need to discuss with your stoma therapist if you can manage this or not. So mild, once again, mild stoma prolapse occurs because of the increased abdominal pressure forcing the intestine to be pushed outward. So risk factors, again, are going to be extremes of weight. So you gain a ton of weight real fast or you lose weight real fast. If you have very weak abdominal muscles, and we see this more common in babies because their abdominal muscles are not very strong. Also, if there's a very large opening in their belly from the surgery, maybe the bowel was very swollen at the time of the ostomy uh, formation. When your ostomy was made, your bowel was very swollen. And so the hole had to be made bigger. Then with time, the bowel will shrink down and then you still have this big hole. So that can cause that as well. 
Uh, and also extra pressure from coughing, sneezing, constipation, pregnancy can cause stoma prolapse. Next slide, please. So how do we fix uh, stoma prolapse? So the, there's multiple ways to do this. Um, and the majority are we either trim the extra bowel out, uh, off and then re-mature the ostomy. You can also tighten that opening that's too big and allowing the bowel to go on itself. There's other fixation, internal fixation options as well. So we can fix this uh, and it is usually successful, but there is again, a higher chance of this recurring if you've had it once. Next slide. So in conclusion, peristomal hernias are very common and are usually a longer term complication of ostomy surgery. And non-surgical management is always what I recommend to my patients. And some people are very disturbed that they have one, but Unfortunately, there are significant complications that can occur when you're trying to fix these. So we only fix them when absolutely necessary. And again, the problem is these will come back. So if it's a small one, you need to um, do your best to try to manage it. And with your ostomy therapist, they can actually help you with that and make it manageable and make your life uh, very easy with the small peristomal hernia uh, because the recurrence rate is so high. And stoma prolapse can happen. Uh, it's another late complication of having an ostomy, uh, but they, they still can arise. And ostomy services and therapists can definitely help you manage these problems and other conditions that affect your ostomy as well. And I think we're gonna hear some exciting news uh, from the UOAA later uh, about telehealth options for patients with stoma. So we can wait for that. I don't wanna give it away, although I partially did. Uh, so next up, I have our brilliant uh, nurse practitioner, WOC, Ashley Croft, and she's gonna to talk to you about ostomies and peristomal hernias as well. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Saranza. That was absolutely amazing. You did such a really awesome job and I always learn something new every time that I hear you talk. So thank you so much. Thank you. So I'm Ashley. I'm gonna talk about non-surgical management for hernias. Um, and I work through the University of Rochester. So if, next slide. So here are the objectives that I'm going to talk about today. Um, there's going to be quite a bit of overlap between some of the stuff that I'm going to talk about and what Dr. Speranza talked about for a couple of different reasons. Um, you know, we all learn best by repetition. And also, I'm going to gear it a little bit more towards how you can improve your ostomy care and um, some things to think about for that. Um, I'm going to go over what a hernia is, um, you know, what the prolapse is, even though Dr. Sorenza did an excellent job um, describing that, um, and when we can be concerned just related to ostomy care. Um, we'll go over the risk for hernia, how we'll go into a lot of prevention. Um, then we'll dive into the non-surgical management interventions that we implement, um, and then we'll talk about some other kinds of products. And then I do want to briefly touch about um, weight loss because that can be a really uh, big help help when we're trying to help our symptoms for, um, for pain from the hernia. Okay, next slide. So some of the pre-lecture questions that we got from our team were, um, people, a lot of people asked like how far stomas should stick out of their abdomen and you know what they should look like. So I wanted to start off by describing kind of if we had a crystal ball, like what a great stoma would look like. Um, so ideally they would protrude two to three centimeters above the skin surface. That way it's easier for the stool or the urine effluent to fall into the pouch easier. Um, um, they usually are nice red, beefy red, or pink in color, and that's just because the bowel that comes out of your um, abdominal wall has a very vast blood supply. So this is the color that we want to see. Um, the shape and the size, like Dr. Speranza said, may change over time, um, and that's due to many different reasons, like 
weight loss, weight gain. Anytime anybody loses or gains weight, it's all in the abdomen and the contours around the stomach can change. Um, so if you get a hernia, a prolapse, any kind of recent surgery, that can change the shape and the size of it. So when we're concerned is, you know, any kind of sign of a blockage. So if you have no output combined with severe abdominal pain and you're vomiting, like you can't keep food or fluid down, um, that's when you go right to the emergency room. Um, it's also emergency when the stoma turns black in color. That just indicates that there's a, you know, um, lack of blood supply that's to your stoma and that needs to be addressed as well. Okay, next slide. So kind of piggybacking on Dr. Speranza, I'm just going to briefly go over, you know, what is the hernia? So like she alluded to, and what I've been telling my patients a little bit more recently is that your stoma technically is a hernia. It's but it's on purpose or planned. Um, but a hernia occurs when more um, smaller large intestine comes through that break in your abdomen due to a weakness that's there, um, or there's too much pressure too soon after surgery. Um, you're at highest risk right after surgery, but because you have your stoma, you're always gonna be at a little bit higher risk um, compared to people who don't have stomas. Um, next slide. So kind of, um, just I'll briefly go over what a prolapse is. Um, so it's just when defined as your bowel and or your stoma um, telescoping out at least five centimeters um, out of your belly. And then you'll experience um, lots of stomal swelling with this as well. So not only is it going to stick out more, it's also going to increase in size. So um, if you have a pre-cut appliance, um, there's more likelihood of that appliance digging into your stoma and causing bleeding. So that's why we want you to contact your ostomy provider so we can make those adjustments. Um, some other helpful tips to help is so, so say you have your um, prolapse and you know you're having normal bowel or urine output just fine and you don't have any problems. Some there are some uh, reduction measures that you can take to be able to um, do your peristomal care and get a really nice tight fit. So some of those things, you can apply ice to your stoma like 15 minutes before, that might help to reduce it. Like Dr. Speranza said, like laying flat, that might help to reduce it a little bit. Um, sprinkling sugar helps some people and some other, I've seen it um, both ways, so you could always give it a try. But um, it's just really making sure that we increase the opening to you know, allow for that extra room. That way we don't cause trauma. Um, there is a, um, we'll talk about a lot of belts and different kinds of um, products that we can use, but there's um, a prolapse overlay that we can add to the hernia belt to help kind of prevent it from sticking back out if it's a nice reducible prolapse. Okay, next slide. Great. So we always try to catch people before surgery um, to give as much pre-op education as we possibly can. But as everybody knows, um, we can't always plan these types of things. So um, kind of identifying everybody's risk for surgery. So um, roughly 50% of people with stomas of all types um, can and I know that's a higher number than what Dr. Speranza said. Um, this is kind of just referring to our clinic and some of the other literature that's out there. It is so common for people to get hernias. Um, and like I said before, the risk is the highest right after surgery, just because you know, you're so much swollen, that break in your abdomen is brand new and your abdominal muscles are very weak. And a lot of times um, people are coughing or, you know, they have um, what they call an ileus where their bowel isn't necessarily um, woken up yet. And so some people are vomiting and that puts a lot of extra pressure on their belly as well. So there's lots of different reasons why we get it. Um, but some other um, factors that might increase your risk for hernia is, you know, just having a larger abdomen and that kind of go coincides with, you know, weakened abdominal muscles as well. And so, like I said, we always want to try to educate people as much as possible before surgery. But as soon as, um, you know, they come back after surgery, if we haven't seen them yet, we just really implement interventions as, as fast as we can. Okay, next slide. So a lot of people don't necessarily know that they have a hernia or they're like, well, how do I know if I have one? So a lot of times um, there's an event that happens. Um, 
for example, I had somebody come in saying, I really just needed to rearrange my living room furniture and I felt a pop in my abdomen. I was like, okay. <laughs> so anyway, she knows that she shouldn't have done that, but usually there is some kind of strenuous event that people can recall around the time that they um, notice the changes. So um, also they'll notice that their stoma size or they might have a lot of leaking problems because as you get a hernia, the stoma size widens, and so your pre-cut appliance um, might not fit properly anymore. So we just need to make some adjustments for that. Um, a lot of times also, if the hernia is very small, you might have some like throbbing or aching um, in your lower abdomen around your stoma um, that might you know, kind of progressively get worse throughout the day. And then when you lay down, it all goes away because you know the bowel kind of goes back in. Um, and then if you notice really any of these symptoms, um, really it's a good idea to contact your ostomy provider. That way they can make the adjustments um, quickly so you can, so we can optimize your quality of life. Okay, next slide. So kind of just uh, continuing on the prevention train. So we usually tell people um, right after surgery, we have a 10 pound weightlifting restriction for the reasons that we already talked about. Um, we're generally a little bit more conservative in our clinic and we do serve a lot of elderly people. So we usually say um, the 10 pound weightlifting restriction will be in place for about two months, um, pending how they're recovering. We do see a fair amount of younger people also, and they are able to um, lift that restriction a lot quicker. Um, we tell people to really limit the movement of pushing and pulling. So it's not really just the heavy lifting. It's really anything that puts extra um, pressure on your abdomen. And so that includes sneezing and coughing and vomiting. Um, we encourage if you don't already have a, um, a belt to kind of like put some counter pressure on it or like hug a pillow. That way, you know, you can kind of just kind of stabilize your abdomen if you're doing those things. And if you can imagine during COVID, we had a ton of people with hernias come in um, just because of coughing. Um, so depending on your risk for hernia after surgery, um, and if you want to potentially go back to work a little bit sooner, we'll get a semi-custom um, hernia support belt so we can get you on your way. Uh, next slide. So these are just kind of going over proper body mechanics, and these are really great for anybody, even without a stoma, but it's really just lifting with your legs, not with your back, and kind of don't keep things away from your body, keep objects more closer to your body, and that way you have a less likelihood of hurting yourself. Okay, next slide. Um, I do like to tell people, especially if they have some anxiety, like underlying anxiety, or um, if they're having a hard time coping with having a stoma initially, um, breathing exercises are an excellent way to sl like slowly re-engage your core. And so this method, um, they do a deep breath in for four counts and they hold it for seven. And then while you're holding it, you kind of gently tighten your core at the same time, and then you exhale for eight counts. And so it's just a really nice, effective way to start re-engaging those muscles um, so we can start to do some of the other exercises that, um, that I'm going to go over now. Okay, next slide. So this exercise is a pelvic tilt. It kind of looks like they're not really doing much, but if you can see on the, um, the black and white photo in the middle, um, you can see the gap underneath from the floor to the person's uh, back. It's kind of just lifting up your pelvis and then eliminating that gap. And it's really just that slow movement that can really help make a difference to slowly re-engage your core. Okay, next slide. This next exercise is really nice. It's just kind of um, keeping your back flat on the floor while tilting your knees from side to side. Um, this also can, you know, do the lateral abdominal muscles and just kind of um, help with it as an adjunct therapy to the, the other exercises. Okay, next slide. So now we have a hernia. So how do we move forward with it? So Dr. like Dr. Sperenza said, um, we really try to um, manage these 
non-surgically just because the rate of recurrence is so high. So we will identify any of the issues of concern um, and it likely takes more than one intervention to make a really nice solid plan. Um, so we might make adjustments to your wafer opening um, and then after we find the appliance that works for you, we'll um, measure and fit you for a hernia support belt. So. I'm sure many people have Googled or um, know of many different types of hernia support belts. So there are lots of products out there on the internet. Um, I'm just gonna talk about um, a few that we use in our clinic and ones that people love. Um, I don't have any financial incentives from any supply company whatsoever. It's just what is best for my patients. Um, one other thing I wanted to mention is that if people have um, pain, like abdominal pain with their hernias and they are overweight, weight loss can really help with that symptom control. And it might also help to decrease the size of the hernia. It won't go away, but it might help it be manageable. Uh, next slide. So any kind of belt that we generally recommend are um, custom made for you based on your waist circumference and the type of ostomy appliance that you have. Um, some pearls is that we, um, when you're laying flat, your hernia reduces back in. So when you put the belt on, do it when you're laying flat. That way you don't have to work against gravity. Um, these belts that are on the right are belts that you can kind of get on Amazon that are adjustable. They're kind of more of a one size fits all type of appliance. Um, you can use those if you don't have an ostomy provider that can order you one. You can get these belts um, on Amazon or medicalmonks.com um, and you can use your HSA money. So that's really helpful. Um, and then these ones, the hole is adjustable. So you might not get like the tightest fit or the most support that you possibly can, um, but it's definitely better than nothing and would be better for prevention. All right, next slide. So this belt is a really nice belt that we primarily use right after surgery. Um, so if somebody's at a higher risk for hernia or if they want to get back to work a little bit earlier than planned, um, we will get them this type of hernia support belt. I actually have a sample of it here. It's really nice. Um, this one is by Coloplast and it has a little hand pocket. So you can put your hand, put it around you and then wrap it around just like that. So what I wanted to show is that there's not a hole cut in this to pass the pouch through, but I don't know if this is visible, but this panel right here is different than the other material and you can cut a hole based on what appliance that you're using and then you can use it that way. Um, the belt also has some grippies on it to make, um, to make it stay in place so it doesn't wiggle around. So it's a really nice option. You can get up to four of these per year through your insurance. And um, it's also really nice if you like go back and forth between a couple different appliances, um, that way you can get more of them covered from your insurance. Okay, next slide. So these belts from New Hope are the kind of bread and butter to what we order for a more customization of hernia support belts. Um, these belts come in anywhere between three inches, like width-wise, to nine inches, um, and based on weight, uh, waist circumference and what type of um, ostomy appliance that you use. So there's probably about 25 different hole sizes that we can choose from. Um, so it's very specific um, to what appliance that you use. So that's why we like to wait until the stoma size has shrunk after surgery. That way we know what ostomy appliance you're going to use long term. So they help to protect and reduce hernias. Um, they also help protect hernia repair. So if anybody does end up getting a repair, we'll try to get one of these right away and to minimize recurrence. It gives a full encompassing um, support around your abdomen. Um, and it can also increase your wear time because you're kind of keeping your ostomy appliance in place. Um, a lot of people have asked if um, wearing a hernia belt and with a prolapse overlay, um, I'll talk about that in a second, um, increases the risk for obstruction and it does not. Your appliance goes through the, um, goes through the hole and it doesn't obstruct in any way. Um, the bottom picture, I don't know if you can see that, but it's there's a little flap that's right next to the hole. And that in, if you put the belt on when you're laying flat, um, you know, your, your hernia or your pro prolapse can reduce. And then that prolapse just goes right over top of it. And that kind of prevents it from coming out. 
So you will need to empty a little bit more often, um, but it doesn't obstruct anything from coming out. Um, so these belts are lesser covered be just because they're a little bit more expensive and you can get up to two of these per year. Okay, next slide. So this is the beloved stealth belt and I'm sure um, there's lots of people that know more about them than I do. I don't, um, I can't prescribe them. I can't get them through, uh, in people's insurance, um, that the, in, just because they're not covered, but people absolutely love them. The material is excellent. It's like a neoprene wicking, uh, fabric and it's really great for water activities, but they do also offer a hernia support version, which is basically two inches of additional support around the flange just for management. So, I have seen it in um, in person and it is a little bit more flimsy. So it's kind of designed a little bit more for mild to moderate hernia. So if you have an extremely large hernia, it's not going to be really helpful, but um, people really love these because it helps them feel more secure. Um, I have also had a couple people um, say that they have bought this online and then they submitted their receipts to their insurance company if they have been partially reimbursed. So we are currently working on trying to get them um, covered by insurance as well. Okay, next slide. So this is called the Stoma Dome. It's a protective piece of plastic that you can put on your ostomy appliance. Um, in case there's any risk for trauma. There's a lot of um, people who, you know, have potential increased risk for trauma at their work. So they need a protective device just so it doesn't, um, doesn't harm it. So this is something that people can buy on Amazon or medicalmonks.com. Unfortunately, it's not covered by insurance. It isn't the cheapest thing ever, but a lot of people really like it, um, especially if their you know, stoma is prolapsed quite a bit and they need that protection. So it's about $60 for the piece of plastic itself. And then that comes with 52 elastic strips. And then um, it's $30 for additional 52, 52 strips. So this is kind of how you apply it. It comes with the part of the Velcro already on it. And then you just put the disposable one on your current pouch and then it just kind of Velcros on in place like that. Okay, next slide. So these are just some extra tips and tricks and helpful information. So like we kind of have already talked about, the goal is always going to be to prevent the hernia from getting bigger. So if somebody comes in and their stoma and their parasomal hernias are relatively small, I'm like, this is perfect. It's not really bothering you. Let's prevent it from getting bigger. And we really try to harp on the interventions like immediately just so we can optimize everybody's quality of life with this. Um, so the larger that the parasomal hernia is, the more uncomfortable that it might be. So intervention, again, like immediately is key. Um, like we all talked about um, before, you know, a lot of people live perfectly active, normal lives with hernias, um, but then some other people's might be really bothered by it and it like cause them significant pain. So if we've exhausted all of our interventions and, you know, you've been deemed a good candidate for surgery, then we'll refer you to our beloved colorectal surgeons, and they can, um, you know, give their input and assessment to see if surgery might be helpful. Um, a lot of times too, I just wanted to mention this, um, if somebody has a little bit of a larger um, abdomen and, but they're having leaking problems and they're not really quite sure, we might not be able to see the hernia visually. Um, so then we kind of go based on clinical symptoms and then we could get imaging if we needed to. So we don't necessarily have to see it clinically to be able to diagnose it. We can kind of just base on um, what problems they might be having. All right, next slide. So I wanted to talk a little bit about weight loss. So um, a lot of people have come through our office from lots of other institutions or even our own and just say like, I want reversal or I want my hernia to be repaired and I've been told that I need to lose weight and I don't know how to do that. So weight loss is really hard. Um, so a good starting point, if you want to try to um, pursue weight loss independently, you know, tracking your um, macronutrients on apps such as Chronometer or MyFitnessPal can really be helpful for sustained, inconsistent, and safe weight loss. Uh, next slide. 
So I just wanted to highlight, um, this is just an opportunity uh, at the University of Rochester. It's called the Healthy Living Center. So um, people who qualify for insurance coverage, um, who have diabetes or chronic kidney disease, um, there are a couple other underlying qualifying conditions. Um, they might qualify from a consultation from the registered dietitian um, through this health, Healthy Living Center. Um, and then it's a really nice comprehensive program where, you know, we discuss weight loss with meal planning. Um, you know, you get the registered dietitian, you get lab work to, you know, manage any kind of, if you have high cholesterol, um, it'll also give some exercise programs. They also have a smoking cessation program and a stress reduction aspect to it. So if you're not in our system or um, don't have access to our system, if you're in another state, maybe check out your institution to see if they have something similar to this. Um, next slide. So I wanted to touch on the injectables just because it's such a hot topic nowadays. Um, this is something that people can pursue if they don't qualify for a dietitian coverage through their insurance. Um, there, is, there are weight loss clinics uh, throughout the country. I know our Highland Hospital has one um, and they do the medical uh, weight loss management there. So they have the injectables um, such as Ozempic, you know, that cover people with diabetes. They have Wagovi, Saxenda. And then they also um, have something called Qsimia, which is topiamate and fent uh, fentermine. And that actually is their kind of go-to in first line um, treatment regarding weight loss, just because they have such high success with it with uh, fewer side effects than the injectables. So I just wanted to touch on those. Um, and some other people really um, wish to pursue bariatric surgery. So I wanted to touch base on this a little bit because we've had many bariatric surgery patients come through that have needed stomas after their bariatric surgery. And there have been a lot of complications, um, especially for the fecal diversions um, where and the ileostomy patients. So you know, their nutrient absorption might be altered and there's a lot of gas that, um, you know, that they can potentially have. So um, if somebody is wanting to pursue bariatric surgery, I would really strongly advise maybe the medical management side first. And then if that's, you know, not working and they, then they need surgery, then, you know, obviously that's fine. But um, I just wanted to throw that out there that, you know, there's been a lot of complications with bariatric surgery patients. Um, okay, next slide. So I wanted to talk about our clinic. Um, it is a very unique cl clinic. We are um, located in the Division of Colorectal Surgery at the University of Rochester, but we also we also are freestanding, meaning we see any patients. So we don't need um, referrals. They're not really required, but they are preferred. But if you don't have them, it's not a big deal. Um, and we do offer virtual visits. Um, we prefer to see people in, in person if they're having any kind of ulcerations or um, peristomal uh, leaking problems or skin issues. Um, but if that's not possible, we are happy to see people via telemedicine as well. Okay, next slide. And then this slide, this slide is very busy. This is just highlighting everything that we do. Um, but I just wanted to highlight that we you know we do see all patients regardless of stoma, regardless of insurance, regardless of, you know, socioeconomic status. Um, we do a lot of pre-op education. We do lots of stoma marking because we like to identify where the stoma is going to be located if we can, if we can choose to. Um, we see pa patients post-op and then we see patients for the rest of their lives if, the, if it's a permanent stoma. So it's a really nice comprehensive place um, and we are happy to see anybody. Okay, next slide. So in conclusion, like we talked about, hernias are extremely common, um, and the goal is prevention from day one. If you're experiencing leaking, any kind of new issues, or have any kind of um, any kind of questions about anything regarding your hernia, um, contact your current ostomy provider because things can change even if you've had your stoma for a long period of time, or you can contact our office at the University of Rochester. Um, and I just wanted to highlight that there really isn't just one fix to a problem. We usually have to implement several interventions to be able to manage something. Okay. Next slide. I think that's it. Yep, that's it. Thanks, everybody. I really appreciate being here today.
Awesome. Thank you both so much. You're the dream team. I mean, <laughs> truly, it was just the best of um, both worlds, both the surgical approach and then also the management um, that you do so much of, Ashley. So thank you. Yeah. Um, you know, as I was looking at the comments, um, there's over 300 people that have joined us tonight. Um, you know, all these brave folks that have gone through life-changing ostomy, life-saving ostomy surgery, but then have developed these complications of a hernia or a prolapse. And, you know, the way you started out, uh, Dr. Speranza, when you said how crucial it is for, you know, people that are living with ostomies to have educational opportunities to really learn about what it is that's going on with their body. So again, I just am so glad we had you here tonight. And I know we have a bunch of questions um, to get to. I had a couple of my own just to clarify and then we can move on uh, to our viewers. Um, first of all, I noticed you guys were using ostomy therapist and um, uh, is, that, is that the same thing as a WOCN? And can you just explain uh, if there was a difference there? Do you want me to go? Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, there is a little bit of a difference. The Certified Ostomy Association is through our um, our Wound Ostomy Incontinence Society. And so Wound Ostomy Incontinence is a trademark brand name that is just designated for their designation, essentially. So if they're ostomy certified, then they're a WOC nurse or an ostomy nurse. Um, certified through their entity. If it's an ostomy therapist or a um, parasomal therapist, they may or may not be certified. Okay, good to clarify. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so, you know, there's been a lot of comments, uh, of course, about people dealing with their own situations. And, you know, if you're in Rochester, New York, you can go and see the Dream Team uh, there at the University of Rochester Medical Center. If you're not, you can go locally and find your ostomy specialist. Um, but I did want to touch on um, what Dr. Speranza brought up about the, um, the new partnership that UOAA has with the wound um, company. So just to give a little bit of background about that, we can put the link into the chat where if you are um, needing to see a specialist for your ostomy and you don't have access to that locally, um, you can uh, go onto our website and you can get started there. So we have partnered with the Wound Company to bring certified ostomy nurses to ostomates and their caregivers across the United States. For a one-time direct payment of $125, the Wound Company certified ostomy nurses provide people with personalized support via Zoom and text and email for 30 days. Um, so this is gonna be coming from the privacy of your own home. Um, if you have something specific that you really want a nurse to take a look at, go ahead and um, use that as an option. Um, we had a question from Betsy, uh, Betty's Curiosity. Oh, let's go to Linda first and then I'll get to that. All right. So Linda AG says, hello, I have a colostomy APR due to anal cancer. I'm healthy and cancer free. However, two peristomal hernia repairs. I've had one and I have another small hernia. How many hernia repairs can generally be done? Good evening, Linda. And thanks for that great question. Uh, so, you know, you can have um, multiple repairs, uh, but you do have to realize that uh, if it's a very mild hernia, it still can recur. So if your hernia is not bothering you too much and you can work with your stoma nurse uh, and uh, get a lot of conservative management, that may be the best option. Um, you've only had two repairs and, you know, it's definitely not unheard of to have more than that. As you can sort of, I was looking through the te text chat and basically there's people who have had multiple repairs, but just understand that you do have a higher chance of it coming back. So if it's really bothering you, then you definitely should talk with your surgeon and they can possibly see if you meet the criteria to go to the, back to the operating room. So just so I got this right, your recommendation, I know you can't prevent a reoccurrence of a hernia coming. I know that's the kind of the nature of the beast, unfortunately. But um, Ashley, you were saying that breathing exercises post-op, like day one post-op to really get those abdominal muscles engaged again is a good thing to start with. And then you also recommend sometimes abdominal binders or um, support belts. You mentioned the coloplast mm -hmm. semi-custom belt. That would be something mm -hmm. post-op to maybe prevent or hope to prevent a recurrence. 
Is that yeah, absolutely. So if somebody has a parasolar hernia repair and then they need to, you know, get a belt right away, we'll do like one of the semi-custom belts first, um, just because, you know, their bellies are really swollen. So we don't want to get them more of the custom one because they don't get as many of them. So we'll do the semi-custom one um, just so they can have that extra support while they're healing. And so the breed, like it's starting to engage the core should happen maybe like a few weeks after surgery, not necessarily right after surgery, because, you know, they're probably not up for it yet or, you know, ready for it yet, but we'll kind of, you know, take it slowly, but surely. Okay. Make sure they're Thank ready. You. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's get to some other questions. Um, let's see. Uh, from Lisa, my husband had a peristomal hernia around his ileostomy. The surgeon performed a sugar baker repair. What are long term effects from this type of technique? Been, that's been done? So a sugar baker repair is a type of uh, repair that we perform. And it was that one, I don't know if you recall seeing the mesh, it was sort of off to the side where the bowel goes underneath and you put the mesh uh, up. And that has relatively good results uh, as far as these types of repairs go. Long-term effects, uh, as long as he's careful and as long as he, you know, is careful with weightlifting and straining uh, and doesn't do, you know, lift heavy objects. He should be very, you know, he should do relatively well with that. And so I think it's a great repair and he should definitely have a hopefully long term outcome as long as he's, you know, keeping, you know, within the guidelines what his surgeon recommends as far as uh, weightlifting and things like that. Would you recommend a support garment for a situation like that or kind of just activity dependent? I think it's activity dependent, but I also, you know, and I think I have a small umbilical hernia. So, you know, I have to be careful of that. Um, and so I, you know, I could see myself someday maybe wearing an abdominal binder or something. But, you know, I think there's the support garments are so... Uh, useful and it was really wonderful to see Ashley did such a nice job summarizing all those wonderful products and she even had a show and tell um, looking at that one uh, uh, belt uh, so I would definitely if I had an ostomy I would definitely invest in those support garments because I think that that can only enhance the longevity of your ostomy and hopefully prevent ostomy peristaltic hernias and prolapse Great. Yeah. And it was super helpful for me to have a, a measurement for the prolapse. So you were saying any, this in the stoma is protruding more than five centimeters. That's for the prolapse. That's it's when you start. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So that was good. Again, I was taking notes, learning things. Uh, Betty's curiosity, what tests are needed before a repair? Great question. Yeah, that is a great question. And I'm sorry I didn't address that earlier. And I actually meant to. So obviously you need to see your doctor and your doctor should perform a thorough history and a physical. Nothing really takes the place of a good physical exam. Um, but uh, one of the tests that I uh, really require before I would consider an ostomy repair in an elective setting, what means non-emergent setting, would be a CT scan. Um, because that's going to tell me uh, information about the abdominal wall, what else may be inside the hernia, things like that, besides just being able to palpate it. So I like to get a CAT scan. Um, that's pretty much what I need. Good to know. Nancy asks, does age affect fixing a peristomal hernia? Well, um, I, age is not a consideration. If a person has a peristomal hernia that is incarcerated or causing blockages or causing other life-threatening issues, we will operate on a peristomal hernia at any age. Um, obviously, the person has to be healthy enough to undergo surgery. So, you know, but luckily with the great anesthesia care that uh, is available today, most people can do very well and tolerate uh, hernia repair and can go home sometimes the next day or even the same day. That's good to know. Uh, oh, do hernia belts actually work? 
I'm going to let Ashley talk. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So they really help in preventing the hernia from getting bigger. If that's what the question is, there really isn't anything that will take away the hernia except for hernia repair surgically. Um, but they really can be helpful to minimize symptoms and they can reduce it a little bit, but it's never really going to go away. But like I talked about, the goal is really to prevent it from getting bigger. Cause if you can imagine, if you think that your hernia is big, it can always get bigger. That's good perspective. Oh, yeah, this was the question I had uh, I had saw earlier. So Betty's curiosity, I love that username, by the way, um, can keep can you can you keep your stoma if you need surgery? So I think she means does your stoma, you know, do you actually change surgically the stoma during the repair of the hernia? So if you're just doing one of the uh, mesh repair types, then you definitely keep it. We try to preserve it, especially if it's a good ostomy. If it's brooked and it's high enough and there's no skin problems with your hernia or there's minimal skin problems, if it's good height, if the bowel quality is very good, you don't need to take the whole stoma down. Um, a lot of times we can do the mesh internally under the abdominal wall laparoscopically. That's typically how I would repair it. Cool. All right, Deidre, Holly girl, is it normal to have burning on the intestines in the hernia during diminished output? On liquid soft diet now to decrease obstructions. Well, if it's an abnormal pain uh, that's not typically there when there's decreased output, that means there's probably increased pressure in your abdominal wall. So, and that could be irritating it and maybe the output is blocking, partially blocking the bowel, which causes sort of a backflow um, and something's blocking it partially. So therefore it could definitely cause burning um, or bloating or pain. Um, you know, definitely you should probably talk with your doctor about that because that doesn't sound too good. You might be, have a partial blockage. Um, a liquid diet, soft diet, um, you know, if the, if you have a blockage, it, that may still may not help. So um, as long as you're able to hydrate yourself, um, but uh, you should be okay, but you should definitely seek medical attention if you're having diminished output. You agree with that, Ashley? Amen. <laughs> Okay, Kimberly, again, is it okay to try to strengthen your core with a peristomal hernia? Do you want to, you mind? I can do it. Okay. So we do encourage people to try to, you know, just slowly increase their strength, but I would definitely advise it after you've received a supportive garment, like one of the custom hernia belts from your provider. Yeah. And we actually had an ostomy, a previous ostomy academy uh, regarding foundations for uh, recovering from ostomy surgery. So this was an occupational therapist last year, mm -hmm. Charlotte Foley, who came on. She's also an ostomate and an athlete. And she, yes, recommends the same thing and, and kind of has developed a program to help people progress with their core strengthening. There were a lot of questions um, about, you know, can I do push-ups? Can I do planks? What mm -hmm. can I do? And um, you know, speaking from experience with somebody with an ileostomy I've had for 12 years, you know, there's always that fear in the back of your mind. You know, you've come so far, you don't want to do anything um, to hurt yourself, to injure yourself. But, you know, I hear you, you want to have that strength and core, um, yeah. but you have to do it in a safe way. And that support garment is a, is a key I'll variable you know. there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Definitely. awesome. And the only other caveat I would suggest is don't do it right after surgery. Obviously, you need to let your body heal from your operation. And then, you know, two two months out, then you can hopefully, I'm pretty conservative with that as well. I like my patients to take it easy for the first couple of months. And then they can gradually start ramping up with their activity level. So the breathing, the diaphragmatic breathing, that's okay. But anything else would be too much. Is that what you're saying, Dr. Speranza? I'm sorry, the breathing. The the diaphragmatic breathing that, that Ashley was talking about, is that okay after surgery or would you like to not do the deep breathing either? 
I think right immediately after surgery, there's going to probably be some pain there. I think once the pain diminishes, usually that's sort of signs and signals that you can gradually start. The breathing is okay, I think. I don't think that's the worst thing to do, but I do think, you know, gradually. And if, you, if you're having pain, then that's definitely something to tell you to stop what you're doing. Okay. So listen to that pain and let that be your guide. I gotcha. Okay. Todd Watts. Can the doctor address repairing the peristomal hernia and reversing the ostomy at the same time? Is this even done? Are there increased risks? Great question, Todd. So often uh, we do that and Ashley knows that. So a lot of times we will do a uh, reversal of an ostomy and then we repair the hernia defect where the ostomy was uh, and that is usually very effective and it's much better than having to undergo two operations. So we, we almost always do it that way. So definitely. Joe asks, I have a prolapse when I exercise or go for a long bike ride, my pouch is bloody, but it doesn't last. Is this normal? Ashley, you want to try to? Yeah, I would suspect that just with the exercise, your stoma is probably swelling and the ostomy appliance is digging into your stoma. So you may, if you have planned exercises and depending on how often you change your appliance, you may want to trim it out a little bit just to give your stoma a little bit of extra room so it doesn't cause that trauma. So I want to say it's normal, but I can see why you're having that. And again, if you don't have a, a local WOCN or ostomy therapist that you can go to, um, you can access that virtual clinic that we have um, on our website. I know there's been several comments about how, how awesome you guys seem and how great your program is in, um, in New York. So if you don't have access to them, um, there is still ways that you can get um, eyes on your stoma. Um, I think, yeah, ostomy therapists or uh, WOCNs are, are angels. Yeah, they're just, they're a special breed. Uh, Sharon asked, how soon after surgery can you start exercises um, that were recommended? So you were saying like two months, is that-ish? I'm a stickler. I mean, different different surgeons have different criteria, but you know, you're, you're dealing with the abdominal wall. So I say eight weeks. Um, others may say, you know, six, 12, you know, it's just really dependent on your surgeon. But on average, most surgeons will say about eight weeks. And then you can, and that doesn't mean you can't go walking or do non-strenuous exercises. Definitely, we want you up walking, walking around the block, you know, going up your stairs. That's definitely fine. Okay. It's usually and just tell our people too. Okay. So some gentle exercise, walking, stairs, but nothing too strenuous, six to eight weeks. No weight training. I mean, yeah. I just stay away because it's a slippery slope. You start doing something and then you're going to be doing something else. And it's, yeah. You're like, oh, I feel yeah. great. And then, yeah. Yeah. It's too late. Yeah. The damage has been done. And then, um, yeah, just to reiterate, you said the, um, the support garments right after surgery could be a variable that you would like your, your post-op patients to have. Mm -hmm. Yep. Depending okay. on risk and whether they want to, a lot of people like need to go back to work after sort like, you know, earlier than we'd like them to. So we like mm -hmm. to set them up for success by getting um, the supportive garments a little bit earlier. Wonderful. Okay. I think we'll get some, yeah, get to a couple more questions. Uh, Gary asks, can I continue to golf now that I have a small hernia? You want to I, have I have no objections to that, but I would probably see your stoma nurse and maybe get a nice belt, support belt. I think you'll feel better and more secure with one of those and it will help you, maybe help your golf game. <laughs> right. We definitely, I just want to piggyback on that. Like we really try to optimize everybody's quality of life and anybody who likes to golf, they really like to golf. So we really want to try to get them there. So um, supportive garments. And then yes, like Dr. Sperns said, let's, let's get them to it. So Janice asked about a sternia, a hernia, sorry, that is well below her stoma. So it hurts. 
um, often, so this is a hernia that's not peristomal, but it is uh, another place in your abdomen. Yeah, it might be an incisional hernia from your surgery. Uh, I definitely would see, you know, whenever you have pain, that's not a good sign. So Janice, definitely go see your doctor and talk to them or go see your surgeon and say, listen, I'm having this pain uh, because that's not normal and you shouldn't have chronic pain. And how would you um, evaluate a hernia? Like, would that still be a CAT scan or would you just in the office kind of examine by pressing? Yeah, so I would okay. do a thorough abdominal exam. I'd sort of investigate when Janice had the pain. Does she have it when she's moving around? Does she have it when she's lying down or when she's sitting in a chair or standing or when she's exerting herself? I mean, there's a lot to, you can figure out by just asking questions. And then a very detailed, thorough physical exam can usually figure out where, if, if there's another hernia somewhere else. So definitely see your surgeon. Chris, got, Chris asks, what is considered conservative management? Right. Yeah, it's really anything outside of surgery anything that we can to minimize the symptoms because we do everything based on symptoms, especially pain. So anything that we can do non-surgically. Anything else, Dr. Speranza? Um, no, pretty much conservative. Yep, conservative mm -hmm. management is non-surgical. Linda asks, what specialty surgeon would do a repair? Okay, so I guess I'm a little biased, but I mean, you can ask Ashley as well. Um, I think pay, uh, surgeons who do a lot of repairs of hernias, who of peristomal hernias, who do a lot of repairs of uh, peristomals, who create a lot of stomas. I mean, you, if you're a colon and rectal surgeon, this is what we do all the time. We make ostomies all the time and we take them down all the time. So we know the components. Um, sometimes, you know, very complex repairs, sometimes you need additional specialties like plastic surgery to do a very complex abdominal wall reconstruction. If people have had multiple sites on either side of the abdomen, if they've had multiple repairs with mesh, sometimes you need a complex team. So, but definitely start with the person who created your stoma and if it was an emergency, um, if you don't do that many ostomies, you can always see a specialist colorectal surgeon. What do you think, Ashley? Oh, same. So we do see a lot of people outside our system um, from all over New York State. And so, you know, they aren't already hooked up with us. So I put a lot of referrals in, not a lot, but I have put many referrals in for our colorectal surgeons because they are. Chelsea asks, what other hernia repair options are available outside of mesh? So there are um, reports of people trying not to use mesh, but those repairs are not recommended uh, by myself or even our society guidelines because they are have an extremely high recurrence rate. Mesh hernia options are the standard, pretty much standard of care, how we fix these nowadays. And 2024. Um, you know, there's different types of mesh, but the standard mesh is a permanent mesh. Uh, and um, there have been some people who've tried biologic mesh, but it's also not recommended. And a biologic mesh is something that would eventually be absorbed and um, degrade, and those aren't recommended. Um, different types of abdominal wall reconstructions, you can do the hernia repairs and also moving the ostomy site. But like I said, you know, if you have a hernia in one site, you put a new hernia on and that has a higher, that can also have a hernia as well. So you have to be very careful and you don't want to burn bridges from one side to the other unless you absolutely have to. That's a great answer, thank you. Lance writes, where the best places to buy or get fitted for a support belt? Ashley? Yeah, so 
I would say, number one, try to go to an ostomy specialist in your area. Um, they can measure your waist, determine what hole size to get in your hernia support belt because they all of the holes are different shapes and sizes. And we want to get the absolute best fit without the pouch crumpling. We want it to be nice and flat, but have the best kind of support right directly around it. But if you can't get um, measured from an ostomy specialist, I would say really do whatever you can to get some kind of hernia support belt. Like the semi-custom ones um, on Amazon, they have the adjustable holes. Like something is really better than nothing. Um, or you can do one of the consultations on the UOAA website. Um, that way you can get to maybe just a little bit more guidance. But if you can get measured, that is the best for an ostomy specialist. Betty's curiosity, does the University of Rochester in Minnesota have an ostomy clinic? I believe they do. They have a very strong colorectal program there, so I, I can't imagine they wouldn't. I'm not sure, but yeah, it, it seems like they would. <laughs> oh, I just wanted to um, make a comment. So um, people can go on the Wound Ostomy Incontinence Society's website and search for an ostomy provider in their area. That is something um, that people can just do on their own online to see what kinds of ostomy support is available in their area. Wonderful. Oh, Todd, I love you. Thank you. <laughs> How can we buy the three presenters a drink after the webinar? Thank um, you. Or donate. That's yeah, that's awesome. Donate to the UOAA. It's a fantastic organization. I really cannot say enough about the United Ostomy Association of the Americas. It's, it's just all about the patients. It's all about ostomates. And that's their main goal. And it's education and help and support for patients. It's nothing better. I send all of my patients to the UOAA website every time. It's incredible. It's just real life and life matters. That's right. And you can, um, if you want to donate, um, you can go to our ostomy.org website uh, and there's a donate now button there um, that you can click on and, and do securely. Uh, Rich Rittenhouse. Urological surgeon for repair of urostomy patient peristomal hernia. So, uh, that's a good you, question. Yeah. yeah, that's a tricky one. So, you know, I'm sure in certain areas of the country, maybe the urologic, the urologist will repair the peristomal hernia. Actually, the colorectal surgeons in our division will often repair the peristomal hernias, and the urologic surgeon will be available if there's any issues with it, but we basically do that for the urologist. Um, maybe in other parts of the country, it is different though, Rich. So you should just probably check with your doctors and see who repairs them for your group. We're getting such great questions. Oh, they're I think very good questions. I think we're going to go for another five minutes or so and see how many more we can answer and then we'll wrap up. Okay. Um, Where there's some talk going on right now in the chat about our next UOAA national conference that's going to be in Orlando, Florida in 2025 in August. So you can also get some information on our website about that if you're interested in going. I actually I went to my first national conference last year and it was um, really eye opening. Just you know so much information. There were great speakers there, um, but the community of just kind of looking around and seeing other ostomates and uh, knowing that they know exactly what you've been through. It was a, a good club to be in. That's amazing. Yeah, it is. Do we have any other questions or are we gonna? Oh, okay. Um, Matthew wants to know, he came in late, this may have been answered. Can you still irrigate with a hernia? Hmm. So uh, as long as you don't have obstructive signs or symptoms, I think that that would be okay, but it also depends on if you can get the irrigation catheter in. Um, but that's a sort of a specific question. What do you think, Ashley? I agree. It's tricky um, just because it's, it's harder to intubate. So yeah, I think you would definitely need the guidance of your ostomy provider just to make sure that it's safe. I think you have to be very careful. 
careful with that because the last thing you want to do is perforate the bowel or cause injury. So if it's if you've never had obstructive signs or symptoms and your peristomal hernia is small, I probably would consult with your surgeon. But, you know, I and I might, you know, try it with the supervision of your uh, ostomy nurse um, but and see how it goes. But if you're having any trouble or any pain or any swelling or bloating, I probably would not do that. Good to know. Does a peristomal hernia mean cancer? No, nope. not at all. And as Ashley had stated in her presentation, it's a very um, common occurrence. It happens in, you know, 25 to 50 percent of individuals throughout their lifetime. And unfortunately, it's just with anything as with any other type of condition. The, uh, the abdominal wall can get weaker. The opening where the bowel comes through can get bigger. And that's basically a peristomal hernia. Mm -hmm. Just a mechanical issue doesn't put you at higher risk for cancer. It's just, just something that happens. Good to know. Um, so let's do two more. Um, Susan asked, do you recommend wearing, oh, sorry, let's go to Cindy first. Should you wear the support belt all the time or just when exercising? We usually recommend when you're up and moving around doing activities, especially if you have a larger hernia, um, because you never know when you're going to have to like bend over or, you know, pick something up or, you know, cough or sneeze or anything like that. Um, take it off at nighttime when you're in bed, but generally it's based on your symptoms too. So generally when you're up and moving around doing stuff just to be on the safer side. Good to know. Do you recommend wearing a prolapse prevention strap with a support belt? Yeah, sometimes it depends um, on what your stoma is looking like, the type of your stoma. Um, and if you, if you currently have a prolapse, we don't do them for everybody, especially if somebody's, um, you know, colostomy and they, you know, have a, you know, slightly butted stoma and their stool is like really thick and pasty. Sometimes the prolapse overlay straps can make their stool kind of like sit at the stoma level that could potentially increase the risk of like pancaking underneath the wafer. So we don't do it for everybody. It just kind of depends on individuals. Karen wanted to know, how do I reach out to the clinic to make an appointment? I'm not sure if um, you mean the virtual ostomy clinic on you at the UOAA website or um, the one where Dr. Speranza and Ashley work, but we can um, put both of those links in the chat so you have um, so you have that. Yeah. Well, let's for go ahead clinic, and you just have to make an oh, appointment. Sorry, oh, make an appointment for our clinic. You just got to make an appointment. That's it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, let's go ahead and um, and stop there. Great questions, viewers. Um, I just think that this reiterates how important it is for these educational sessions because you know just wonderful questions. Um, and our hope is really that this program gave you more knowledge and more empowerment, you know, to live the best life that you can uh, with your ostomy. Um, so I want to thank uh, thank you to our speakers, Ashley and Dr. Speranza. You guys were awesome and. Uh, thanks to the UOAA, um, also to our communication and outreach manager, Ed Fuller, and our volunteer moderator, Liz Hiles. They're both the behind the scenes Ostomy Academy uh, broadcasting team. So, um, and, and most especially thank you to all of our, our viewers tonight. So um, again, if you um, have any questions or comments, you can always uh, reach out uh, to me directly. Um, and I can put my, um, my email in the chat. And then we also have an information email at uh, UOAA that you can um, email that to. So unless there's anything else, do you guys wanna close us out with anything that we didn't get to, to say? Any, any parting words? Uh, it was just a really, it was a pleasure to be here. Uh, all of your viewers are so informative and ask such wonderful questions. And I wish everyone good health. And thank you again for the invitation to be able to share what some of the things that we know uh, with you tonight. Yeah.
Same. Thank you so much for having me. I This is an absolute honor to be here. And I just want to let everybody know with Estoma, we see you and we hear you and we are here for you. And um, you are so brave and just keep living. Nothing else I can say to that. Amen. Mm -hmm. Thank you, ladies. And uh, take care, everyone. Stay well. And we'll see you at the next Ostomy Academy in May. Great. Bye, everybody. Thank you. I thank you.